Hello, I'm Faith Rogers, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. This is the April 23rd episode of DKB Med Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series. Thank you for joining us. This activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, DKB Med, and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AAPA credit, as well as AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CE information. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the red Claim Credit button in the webinar console to attest for credit. Otherwise, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. Today's learning objective is to discuss what is known about post-COVID-19 syndrome or long COVID. This educational activity is supported by independent medical educational grants from Gilead Sciences Incorporated, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, and Eli Lilly and Company, as well as in-kind support by DKB Med LLC. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the activity directors, planning committee members, and faculty presenters. With us today, we have Dr. Paul Awater, Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He will be interviewing Dr. Chung, an Assistant Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Neurology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, who will share about his experience at the Johns Hopkins Post-COVID Clinic. Dr. Chung, Dr. Allwater, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you, Faith, and thank you, Dr. Chung, for uh, joining for two conversations about what I think is a a fascinating and highly important issue that's arising uh, because of the pandemic. Um, By way of background, for many years, I've been researching Lyme disease, which is thought to have a potential post-infectious syndrome attached to it, and and also infectious mononucleosis, another one that uh, may have this. So I'm sort of... um, familiar with the landscape of people that uh, appear to have their health uh, more persistently altered after infections. And uh, of course, this has come up with uh, the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus. So I was wondering, Dr. Chung, to me, there's a lot of confusion about terminology and you know, what, what should we be calling this? It seems like the press has some popular names such as uh, long haul COVID and so on, which I think certainly captures imagination. But uh, what are your, uh, what are your thoughts or is is there any kind of organized definitions yet? Well, I think um, probably a little more official term that a lot of people are using uh, defined by NIH will be a past uh, which is post-acute sequels of COVID-19 infection. Uh, however, uh, it's not really defined by any um, you know, pathophysiology or specific clinical symptoms. Uh, I think the definition is that if anybody after COVID infection has a long-lasting symptom of more than eight to 12 weeks, um, you know, we call them as having a uh, PASC. Uh, but of course, uh, there's huge overlap between long-haul COVID, long haulers, and a post-COVID syndrome, none of them have any specific definition of what kind of pathophysiology or clinical symptom that they had to have. Uh, uh, as you may know, actually, NIH has recently um, announced a big grant um, uh, about PASC research. And basically, the, one of the main goals of, for that grant uh, opportunity is to really figure out the you know, definition of PASC. So, uh, at this point, you can call whatever. <laughs> Probably there's no uh, nobody's going to be wrong about their definition. Yeah. you know it's interesting because chronic fatigue syndrome, the former Fukada uh, definition, uh, myalgic encephalitis, uh, yeah. post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, uh, mm-hmm. they all use sort of a six-month definition, in fact, of time. <clears throat> where people's health if, and function has been altered in. So I was wondering why this might be shorter because certainly people who are critically ill can take a long time to recuperate. But here clearly with COVID-19, the people with very mild symptoms really feel like they've been uh, whacked pretty hard here. Right, why is it shorter? Um, I, to be honest, I don't uh, know for sure, but I, I assume that especially with the past, uh, they defined eight weeks. I think they wanted to probably catch you know, uh, various things out of post-COVID syndrome. I mean, of course, it's a clinical syndrome, uh, so probably have a heterogeneous etiologist. Uh, so at this point, really don't know the nature of post-COVID syndrome. So I think it's probably safe to safer 
uh, to define something in the shorter term. And also at the same time, uh, it's beyond six to eight weeks. Uh, I think that's probably presumably from infection or inflammation standpoint, it's probably a little more than just a treat infection because um, infection you either, you know, probably even die or just recover. Uh, right. Sure. Uh, but if it's ongoing for more than six to eight weeks, it could be autoimmune, it could be something else, neurological maybe. So that I think that's probably why they rather arbitrarily just define the six to eight weeks. I see. Yeah, uh, you know, I've clearly had uh, people with the uh, coronavirus that really feel like uh, mm -hmm. their symptoms have come on, they're not going away, they were very physically active beforehand, hard charging, type A, and so on. Uh, but I, I was wondering, uh, the, other, the other thing that often comes up in these kind of syndromic issues are whether people are anchoring to COVID versus something else, meaning there's mm -hmm. such a heterogeneous set of issues that might cause people to feel tired or disrupt sleep or feel achy and tired. So um, do you feel that that's going to be tackled a little more rigorously for looking backwards versus just um, trying to understand larger groups of people in this circumstance? I think uh, that's an excellent point, Julian, because chronic fatigue is such a non-specific symptom. And now, you know, you know, everybody's actually reading news about COVID-19 worldwide. You don't have to be a doctor for that. So it's possible that some people connect the dots, they have a COVID infection. They may blame everything to COVID infection now, uh, but it may be something that they had before. So teasing that out will be a, a very important, uh, you know, kind of task for this type of research for a past. Um, at the same time, there are a couple of points that I want to make. Uh, is that first, uh, I may be a little biased. I, I do see, you know, uh, some certain population called postural orthopedic tachycardia syndrome after COVID-19 infection. These people, some of the other long holders or uh, past patients, their level of fatigue is uh, quite severe and significant. It's completely debilitating. And these are the people, a lot of, a lot of them used to be athletic, athletes and very active without any problems. So the, the, although they say it's chronic fatigue for the lack of better terms, uh, the, the, the level of fatigue, the symptoms are quite characteristic and significant so much that it's hard to uh, you know, imagine without having COVID infection or some other thing that they can blame on. Um, 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 and also another point that I wanna make is that I think for a research standpoint, uh, maybe this is a, in a way, uh, you know, better uh, time to figure that out in a way, because uh, of course it's unfortunate that we, we are in COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of people get affected with that. Uh, however, from just from the research academic standpoint, everybody got the COVID infection almost at the same time. And some subset of these people develop post-COVID syndrome. So it's actually in a way, academically speaking, good chance to answer that question, whether this is really uh, associated with COVID-19, it's just a temporal association, or is it just something somebody who's just, you know, had it before and blaming on COVID-19. I think we have a pretty good chance of, you know, answering that question uh, in this time of pandemic. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, you know, I think clearly uh, uh, there are people that there's uh, marked changes and so on. How, um, how uh, do you, what do you find so far in your experience that's different about this group of people? I mean, you've seen other people, I'm sure, who have debilitating illness or chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, uh, POTS patients that seem to often skew um, mm -hmm. uh, and many series to a little more female, sometimes that bimodal uh, wow. sort of teens and young adults and then, you know, middle age. What, what, uh, do you see that same kind of paradigm or is this different or too early to tell? Actually, I don't see a lot of difference. Now, that being said, um, I run the clinic called uh, POTS clinic, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. And, um, you know, a lot of uh, post-COVID syndrome patients uh, refer to my clinic, get diagnosed and confirmed with POTS. And that, it's just not just my clinic. I, I have a lot of colleagues in different parts of the country and other countries in some European countries, they have the same problem. They have a flood of those referrals for POTS patients after COVID-19. A lot of those so-called long haulers turn out to have POTS. 
And uh, when I see them, uh, their symptoms are very typical and characteristic for POTS. And I don't see a lot of difference between the symptoms or clinical features of POTS from just you know, before COVID-19 versus after COVID-19. So, and these people are, as you said, interestingly, uh, a lot of young female with the hypermobile joints. Uh, some people call them as having ehlers danlos syndrome, a uh, hypermobile um, <clears throat> type of connective tissue disorder. Um, and, you know, young, young female, pale, uh, very similar physique. Uh, and I see the quite similar trend, not, not that I'm saying uh, uh, male or el older people don't have it. They do have quite, quite a lot of them actually have it. Just, just, just in general, they tend to have a little more vulnerability to this type of condition. Yeah, I, of course, I, I agree with you. These often are the more severe segment of people that have a post-infectious syndrome, and yeah. uh, uh, you know they may have formal positive tilt table tests or just very orthostatic in the doctor's office. Uh, uh, when you're assessing them. But I've also had patients um, uh, really that just have an enigmatic illness and, and, and do have orthostasis and probably uh, fit into this POTS paradigm. But mm -hmm. we, we've um, done nerve conductions and, and actually um, serial nerve biopsies. And we can sometimes find abnormalities uh, that suggest that there is an, autonom you know, a, a, an autonomic neuropathy, not just a miscommunication mm -hmm. issue. So uh, do you have any sense that that might be going on to this level? Yes, I do actually. Uh, I mean, it's probably well, with the past research large cohort, we can tease out some other different subtypes too. Of course, I'm uh, focused on my particular interest in dysautonomia and POTS, and and quite a significant portion of these patients, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that suggests uh, there's some autonomic dysfunction going on there. Now, that being said, I kind of like to also uh, point out that. Uh, autonomic nerve dysfunction, uh, unlike other types of neurological uh, diseases, let's say, for example, a lot of people see patients with diabetic neuropathy, and we know all their symptoms are. They have uh, numbness, tingling in their fingertip, mostly in the bottom of their feet, more distal di distribution. And, um, you know, uh, it's pretty obvious their distal nerves are damaged, for example. But when it comes to autonomic neuropathy or neurological disorders, their symptom may uh, manifest very widely and differently too. For example, uh, a lot of these patients with POTS or dysautonomia, not only they have also static intolerance, uh, they have they complain of headache, chronic fatigue, uh, pain, and actually brain fog is one of the very characteristic symptoms of POTS or dysautonomia as well, which is presumably from lack of uh, brain circulation there. So, and also uh, chronic nausea or GI symptom, lack of appetite or sleeping problem uh, can be other symptoms. So, uh, you know, I think one has to be kind of careful uh, when they're connecting dots with the autonomic dysfunction and their symptoms. It's not really obvious oftentimes. Yeah, no, Dr. Chung, I think those are excellent points. There's often a lot of overlap and someone might go to a headache specialist and then, you know, they're going to a rheumatologist for fibromyalgia and it's maybe part of the same syndrome. What, what, if you're a, a clinician um, or if you're even thinking, do I have this, uh, uh, but you've never had confirmed COVID, um, is it worth checking COVID antibodies? Is this something that you'd advocate at this time? Whenever they have POTS or... or uh, well, yeah, I, I'm just sort of asking, you know, because mm -hmm. if someone hasn't had clinical COVID-19, mm -hmm. is there any worth doing antibody testing? And really the other uh, piece of this to just sort of finish up is ha what kind of tests do you look for to exclude other things? Should people have normal SED rates and normal mm -hmm. C-react proteins and these kind of things? Oh, I see. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, whether they have to check the COVID-19 antibody or not, um, I, I guess it depends on their clinical context and what kind of symptoms or problems they have. Um, you know, maybe, you know, these days, of course, if they have developed symptoms of POTS, chronic fatigue, brain fog, typical long haul symptoms. Yeah, of course, I think these days it's probably worthwhile to check COVID-19 antibody um, um, that can, you know, make us understand better about why they are having those symptoms. Uh, in terms of diagnostic workup, uh, uh, I think, so generally speak, speaking, um, 
probably it's my own philosophy is that uh, I try to do some diagnostic tests. Um, I try not to do it if, unless, uh, you know, if, there's, if the results of tests don't lead into any meaningful treatment, uh, to, you know, changes in my treatment plans. So uh, that being said, uh, I think primary thing that I'm looking at in terms of diagnostic workup is that first of all, I'd like to kind of rule out other causes of those chronic fatigue or orthostatic tachycardia and other things, uh, particularly uh, in, the, in the, some inherent heart or lung problem. For example, if they have any cardiac arrhythmia, so we can do the halter monitoring. Or if they have any uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, cardiomyositis, uh, they can cause some inherent heart pumping problem. They may have chronic fatigue for sure because their cardiac output is decreased. We know that, uh, you know, especially after severe COVID-19 infection, uh, it's associated with increased blood clot formation. So I always try to check the pulmonary embolism, especially the patient was in ICU before. And pulmonary fibrosis has been kind of, you know, suspected as a, uh, you know, part of our post-COVID syndrome uh, as well. So I try to look at the big, uh, rule out the big things. Uh, but to me, um, oftentimes just checking orthostatic vital signs sitting and standing and see if there's a lot of changes in their heart rate or blood pressure, they can be quite suggestive of uh, autonomic nerve dysfunction going on as an underlying pathology. Yeah, I think that's uh, great advice. Uh, many people have these complaints and it's a simple set of maneuvers that can get you thinking about whether it could be in this uh, kind of category. And I have to say, I, I really applaud you, Dr. Chung, for uh, taking on what's uh, historically been such a challenging set of problems, both to understand, but also to manage. Um, uh, you know, Peter Rowe at uh, Hopkins has uh, been working for many uh, years in the field of, uh, of POTS and so on. And I, I think there's so much yet to be learned and, and gained from this. But hopefully the resources of um, the pandemic uh, and the acknowledgement of this uh, might open other insights to other infectious disorders that seem, it seems to have some kind of common pathway, I think. Uh, in many circumstances that lead to these issues. Oh, I absolutely agree. Yeah, and thank you very much for that. Yeah, and, and yeah, we see a lot of patients who were, who had Lyme disease, Lyme infection, confirmed Lyme infection, um, and develop POTS, you know, still whether that's autoimmune etiology after Lyme or maybe chronic Lyme infection. I think there's a lot of stuff that we have to work on. Well, uh, thank you very much. This is our first uh, uh, um, uh, video podcast. And uh, the second one will focus a little more on some of your management techniques. So Dr. Chung, really, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the red claim credit button in the webinar console to attest for credit. Otherwise, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. To submit questions, please send them to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q as in question, A as in answer, at dkbmed.com. Again, thanks for joining us and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19.